start today by with a welcome to country and and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And on behalf of everyone here in the team, uh, I'm sure you'll join me in paying respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For those that are new to A2EP, we are a non-for-profit organisation uh, funded by our lovely members and, and here they are. Uh, the, the logos from each of them. Uh, these are our members that share our vision to double Australia's energy productivity. And uh, with them, we're progressing to uh, make Australian businesses more profitable and cleaner and helping them decarbonize. And uh, so today, um, we're, this, this webinar that we have will be recorded and the recording and the slides will be issued to you uh, next week. Uh, so yeah, no need to sort of uh, take screenshots and the like. Uh, you'll get a copy of, of each of the presentations uh, next week and along with the recording. Um, so yeah, with that, I'd like to, to kick off and, and set the scene a little bit. And, uh, and, and certainly from a, a lot of ma major energy users, this is absolutely front of mind. And our last webinar, at the end of May, uh, with where we had Tenant Reed from AI Group uh, presenting on energy prices. Uh, yeah, things have, have really only gotten worse since then in terms of the cost for, for energy. Um, it, last month, we discussed how these uh, very high electricity prices, largely led by some uh, coal fired power stations, shutdowns, and planned maintenance and the like. Uh, but things have certainly uh, increased since then. Um, gas prices uh, have increased, but uh, uh, proportionally more than, than what we're seeing for electricity prices. Uh, stats that we're seeing in Europe is, is gas prices are some six times that the rate they were before the, uh, uh, the uh, Russian war on, on Ukraine. Um, so yeah, things are certainly much worse over there, uh, but getting that way here as well. So we're hopeful that this will be a, a very timely webinar for you to help you find some of these solutions to reduce that energy cost. Uh, here is one such example I'd just like to kick off with. Um, and we, uh, this, is, this has come from Windsor Group and a study they did a few years ago for a milk dryer plant. And, and this is largely what we're talking about today, opportunities like this, where you can recover heat from the uh, flue gases from a milk dryer and, and use that heat and put that into the incoming heat for the burner. And, and something like that, saving around 10% of your energy usage. Now, a couple of years ago, when uh, gas prices were below $10 a gigajoule, this sort of project was not viable on a retrofit basis. If it was a new new site, it would be. Uh, but uh, at today's gas prices and what they're looking like in the future, uh, certainly worth a relook there. Um, the other thing I want to, to, to draw your attention is the changes here uh, happening with, with future energy supplies. We go for more renewable heating. Uh, if I say this is a typical setup for manufacturing today where each of the uh, utilities of say refrigeration, steam boiler and air compressors completely running in isolation. Even though each of them has their waste heat uh, uh, being expelled or, or, or uh, uh, waste in, in the system there um, and, and a large percentages of waste as well. Um, something like for a steam boiler where you're probably losing whilst only the boiler may be only 20% up the flue, there's at least another 10 or 20% being lost to, with, with condensate and, and other losses around. So I'd like to, to say going forward, here is one such opportunity that we'll uh, be uh, exploring some solutions for today. And, and that is looking at, instead of operating utilities in a silo, uh, um, having them, them integrated between them. And here's one such way to do that with something of a thermal battery sitting in between a refrigeration plant and a heat pump uh, where, where they could potentially balance out uh, where the uh, heat coming from the refrigeration plant is used by a heat pump uh, and that they're improving the, the coefficient of performance, reducing the size, reducing electrical uh, load, and, and but yet still being able to deliver the, the heating that's needed for the plant. Uh, um, the same similarly for, for an air compressor, whilst not you often not as much heat available, uh, there's still pretty good heat available there uh, to, that can be utilised for different sources and needs, and that, so that can be uh, coupled up with, say, a heat pump system as well. 
one other alternative is if you look at uh, um, combining that with uh, uh, thermal storage on the demand side or flexing your process up and down. And so rather than storing hot water or so in between the refrigeration plant, plant and heat pump, you may choose to run that uh, during the middle of the day when there's plenty of cheap solar power and, and just store up that heat uh, that you may need for the process throughout, a, say, a 24 hour period. And, and so these sorts of solutions, we think, really needs to be closely looked at either for retrofitting or greenfield plants so that you can really reduce your exposure uh, to high gas prices and high firmed renewable prices, uh, just some of the solutions we have in mind. So with that, I'd like to just do a very quick introduction before I kick off on our first speaker. So today, joining us to explore these sorts of concepts further, uh, we have, first of all, Selwyn Oliveira uh, from Alpha Laval. Uh, we've got uh, Paul Keane from uh, GTET, as well as Bill Parkinson from the Jefferies Group joining us. And we also have Stefan Jensen, Managing Director of Scantec Refrigeration, as well as Murray Nottle, uh, from the Carnot Group. I'll give each of them a, a further introduction as we, as we get to them. Um, we thought it would be best to kick off for you today and, uh, and uh, with uh, looking at the actual technologies, uh, the options that you've got available uh, for heat recovery and, and some of the important technologies of the being the heat exchangers to do that. Uh, and what better than to, to uh, utilize the knowledge from the, the largest heat exchanger company in the world is, is from Alpha Laval. Um, so today we have joining us is Selwyn Oliveira. He's the energy division manager for Alpha Laval and has been with the company some, some 28 years. Um, he leads a team of, of really passionate uh, energy uh, and, and engine design professionals um, who really focus on delivering energy efficiency uh, for their clients. Um, he has a passion to assist customers in reducing their carbon footprint and achieve energy savings, um, and as well as meeting their sustainability goals uh, using mainly compact heat exchangers. And uh, on top of that, just on a sidebar, if you had any questions about anything to do with the marine and diesel land, uh, Selwyn's your man as well. Uh, but he's here to talk to you today about uh, heat exchanger technology. So I want to ask you to come off mute and share your screen and, and take it away for us. Yeah, thank you, Jared, for the nice introduction. Uh, much appreciated. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah that's come through. Great. Thanks very okay, much. Very good. Uh, anyway, I'd like to express my gratitude to A2EP for giving Alpha Laval an opportunity to present today on our range of energy efficiency and heat recovery solutions. Most of you would know that Alpha Laval is a global engineering company with its headquarters in Sweden. And we have a very long history and have been in existence for over 139 years. The company was founded by Swedish inventor Gustav de Laval in 1883. Incidentally, the first plate heat exchanger was developed in 1931, which is almost 91 years ago. So it's not new technology, it's been around for a long time, but we've enhanced the product to suit many different industries. So we serve a very vast and diverse range of industries from biofuels, chemicals, HVAC and refrigeration, food and beverages, mining and mineral processing, steel, pulp and paper, wastewater treatment, power generation, oil and gas, just to name a few. So the first uh, story I'd like to bring up, which is a case story in Australia, where we supplied two Alpha Laval micro waste heat recovery units to a company called Pyrocal. Pyrocal is an innovative engineering company located in Toowoomba, Queensland. They build biochar systems that provide waste management solutions for business and government. Pyrocal continuous carbonization technology is a cost-effective system which converts biomass and residual waste to biochar and energy. The production of biochar reduces the volume of biomass and residual waste while creating a potential revenue stream. The Alpha Laval Waste Heat Recovery Unit recovers one megawatt of waste energy from the incinerator exhaust gases and uses this to pre-dry the waste material being fed into the incinerator. This saves the client around $400,000 per annum in waste pre-drying electrical cost, which is a huge sum of money. And the system has a very short payback period of only six months. 
So what exactly is the micro waste heat recovery unit? Alpha Laval Micro is a highly efficient and compact heat exchanger utilizing waste heat from flue gases to improve the thermal capacity of a plant from a level below 30% to more than 80%. It is suitable for various heat transfer media such as hot water, glycol, and thermal oil. It can also be used to produce steam if required. It is characterized by having a very low inertia and small liquid holdup volume. It reaches the operational temperature within minutes and reacts extremely fast to load changes. Another application where we have supplied heat recovery solutions is in refrigeration. Energy costs are rising every day, and as Jared just mentioned, more so in recent times. And refrigeration, of course, consumes a lot of electrical energy. So in a refrigeration cycle, these superheaters and subcoolers can actually make a difference to the energy efficiency, as well as improving the overall coefficient of performance of the plant. After the compressor, the hot refrigerant can be cooled in a desuperheater and thus recover some of this heat energy. This heat can be used to produce hot water, which can be used for various purposes in the plant. Further, a sub, adding a subcooler can help improve the overall coefficient of performance of the rev plant. So we have a range of very efficient compact brace plate and semi-welded heat exchangers get, that can enable this. And the payback period is less than 12 to 14 months, depending on the size of the system. The D superheater recovers heat energy from the refrigeration cycle which would otherwise go to waste. Hot water can be produced from this heat source by raising the temperature from 30 degrees C to approximately 70 to 75 degrees C. This hot water could be used for cleaning in place systems, food processing and wash downs, reheating boiler feed water or plant water supply. These units offer several benefits. They are compact, efficient heat exchangers and have low installation cost compared to traditional shell and tube heat exchangers. They are a quarter of the size and weight of equivalent shell and tube units. Very low approach temperatures of between one and a half to two degrees C can also be achieved. They also provide cost savings in diesel fuel and natural gas consumption in boilers, reduction in condensing load and power consumption in cooling tower or air-cooled condensers or the size of the plate heat exchanger, and potentially less scale formation on condenser surfaces due to lower inlet temperatures. Our new range of gas to liquid heat exchangers are a revolution in waste heat recovery. These heat exchangers offer several benefits. They have exceptional performance with advantages of high heat recovery, ability to handle very high gas temperatures without risk of fatigue, less cooling water required, low pressure drop on the gas side, and high condensing capacity. They're very compact with the resulting benefits of being lightweight, easy to install and integrate into the system together with lower freight cost. They take up a quarter of the space compared to traditional shell and tube heat exchangers. They can be used for a multitude of applications. All applications where a gas or air needs to be cooled or heated by means of a liquid. Some of these applications are combined heat and power, compressed air cooling, charge air cooling, organic Rankine cycle systems, heat recovery, low pressure steam, general heat recovery, etc. Regarding the product specifics, the maximum pressure on the gas side is around 17 bar and on the liquid side, 26 bar. The maximum temperature 750 degrees C. However, we can offer some special units that can handle gas temperatures up to 1000 degrees C. This is an example of a combined heat and power unit where a primary heat exchanger to recover heat from engine exhaust gases was used. This particular duty recovered 14 kilowatts of energy, providing an energy savings of $14,000 per annum using a conservative power consumption charge of 10 cents per kilowatt hour. 
So this resulted in a payback of less than six months. Air compressor. Air compressors are another source where we could recover a lot of heat. And air compressor oil is another example of free waste heat which can be recovered and can generate significant energy savings. You will see more of this in the next slide with a payback calculation. So for a 100 kilowatt compressor electric motor, we can effectively recover 80 kilowatts of waste heat. In this particular example, we assume that the compressor operates 24 hours per day, 20 days per month, and 11 months per year. The investment cost for the heat exchanger is $10,000 and the installation cost around $5,000. This gives us a payback period of only 7.8 months. The daily energy savings is around $96 per day or $1,920 per month or $21,000 per annum. The savings in CO2 emissions is a whopping 338,000 kg per year, thus saving 14,000 trees or earning 338 carbon credits. So thank you for listening. And I now open up the floor for questions or maybe we could take it at the end of this entire presentation. Thanks very much, Selwyn. And yeah, we've certainly got a few minutes for, for questions and we'll see if they come through on the on the Q&A and in the, in the chat there. Um, I, I might make kick off there a bit there, Selwyn. You, the, um, I saw with the heat recovery uh, slide there for the air compressor one, you were heating water from, I think it was 45 up to 65, where the, the oil was coming in at, at 85 degrees. You could go closer, could, because often you've got things like sterilizers running at 82 degrees. Can you go higher than the 65? Yeah, very good question, Jared, and thanks for that. Um, yes, definitely we can go closer to 82, 83 degrees. Of course, it will affect the water flow because we'll need to reduce the flow to reach that high uh, delta T, which is if you're coming in at 30 to heat it up to 80 degrees. So we produce in terms of water flow rate that would be reduced slightly. But uh, if that's what is required, of course, then we need to produce the water at the right temperature for, so we reduce the flow or we have more heat available, which would give us the same flow that we need. Gotcha. And, and a question here from uh, Jose there so asking about, uh, uh, do you have solutions for oil-free air compressors? So more just recovering the, the heat from the air only. Uh, you have such solutions as well. I assume that's that gas to liquids one. Yes, very good question. Uh, and thank you for asking. Uh, I think, yes, we have these gas to liquid heat exchangers, which are designed for oil-free air compressors. So if you're interested, we can definitely look into that specific case and give you some budget costing and designs for that particular application. Good one. And as I understand, so when you guys are not doing the full installation, you'd work with other people like Scantech or, or, or others uh, to do the full installation. Uh, is that the case for the air, the air cooler uh, as well? Yes, correct. I think Alpha Laval, you know, we are more a component supplier or equipment supplier, and we would have to work with either a local mechanical services contractor, which could, you know, install these units for a customer, depending on their location and who is their preferred contractor on site. But it's not a big job because if you see the size of these units, uh, they don't need any heavy foundation or anything. They're very lightweight, compact, and it's quite easy to install them in a day. Gotcha. And we've got time for, I think, uh, one or two more questions, but one here asking about, uh, you, you designed that for a specific load on the heat exchangers. What's if you have a variable load? What, what's the, the plan there? Okay, I guess uh, we would look at what is the maximum load so that we design for the maximum or worst case condition. Or we could also look at a nominal capacity, which is say 85% or so and design for that load. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's how we would design. So we'd say, what is the maximum load designed for that? And then the system would auto automatically tune down itself when the load reduces. So we recover slightly less heat if it's operating at a reduced load. Gotcha. Thanks. Well, we do have a few more questions coming through, and maybe another minute. Let's see if we can squeeze them in here. So, uh, if not, I'll get you to answer them live. Just uh, chart typing in that Q and A box. Um, a, a question here from from Simon: uh, Is the acidity of the condensate stream a problem on those gas to liquid heat exchangers? 
What's uh, the materials? Maybe that's a materials question. Yes. What sort of materials we're talking about for those units? Correct. The standard material is stainless steel 316, uh, but we have uh, uh, what do you call a higher range of material called nickel, uh, which we could use for certain aggressive media, but uh, we would have to look at it on a case by case basis. So assuming it is, there is acidity in the condensate anyway. Um, another question here, uh, can you retrofit the oil recovery uh, to air compressors, oil heat recovery? Uh, usually the compressor suppliers offer it directly and may, may push back on, on someone else uh, uh, touching their, uh, their compressors. Yeah, and yes, we have come across this uh, a couple of times. Uh, it's up to the end customer. Um, uh, yeah, and it's uh, the customer has got to make a choice. And there's like uh, many people know about busy pulp and paper. And I know, uh, you know, uh, they had a pushback from the compressor manufacturer, but then it's the plant manager who makes the decision. If you can see the value of having, uh, uh, you know, heat recovery, heat exchanger, which has a good payback, then he, you know, has, does what he thinks is right for the plant. And Murray, uh, Murray Noddle is going to be joining us a bit later. Murray, do you have a quick comment on that one? Certainly. Uh, uh, Mr. Compressed Air. Um, look, it, it's an interesting one. The compressor manufacturers will give an extended warranty. And so if you go playing around with coolers inside, um, you could cause problems. The main thing is to get the air compressor company on board before you start looking at anything you're going to retrofit. Mm -hmm. uh, so provide, I think they should be happy provided you don't affect the safety of the machine. Obviously they want to sell the equipment uh, but provided you don't affect the safety and the operating space and conditions of the machine, you can generally do it. But there are a lot of things you need to be careful of. Um, as you go, I'll talk about some of those a bit later on. Great. Uh, regarding the questions about all free, yep, you can. Um, again, you need to be careful about added pressure drop and how that's going to affect your machine. And that will depend upon the compressor technology. Brilliant. Thanks, Murray. We'll, so we'll explore that a bit later in the, in the webinar. Fabulous. Uh, uh, many thanks for that. So when there's a couple of questions there about the dollars per kilowatt, uh, maybe a thermal there, maybe you've got some rules of thumb to share there in the chat and, and a question about other opportunities for heat recovery as well. But uh, let's leave it there. So one and many thanks for the presentation. No worries. Thank you, Jared. Okay, I'd like to uh, move on now. And, and you may have seen that the title for this webinar was not just heat recovery, it's energy recovery. And, and so we can look at a, a broader uh, uh, set of technologies such as things like ORC. So I'd like to uh, welcome Paul Keane, the CEO and Managing Director of GTET. And uh, Paul has extensive experience uh, working with multinational auto, auto uh, uh, makers, suppliers, and uh, uh, has held many uh, technical and corporate positions across many countries uh, as well. Um, so in 2010, uh, Paul and, and a partner there launched uh, GTET as one of the few global producers of ORC generators. And then from that zero startup in, in 2010, GTET has been grown into a business with impressive IP, a great product portfolio, and, and some really amazing uh, tier one uh, customers as well. Um, so with that, uh, Paul, I'd like to hand over to you, and maybe you can start that. And uh, uh, and uh, we'll, Sorry, before you do, the, do that, let me just also introduce who's joining you today, because we're very happy that you've got a, you've brought along a, a, a happy client. I've also got Bill Parkinson uh, as a process engineer from Jeffrey's Group. And uh, Bill has a mechanical engineering background coming from Ireland and has a fantastic uh, passion for sustainability and clean energy projects. Uh, working in this energy efficiency uh, sector. Uh, so Bill is a process engineer for Jeffrey's Group, overseeing the installation and commissioning of waste to energy biochar plant, biochar plant built in 2021 uh, and developing an organic fertilizer plant utilizing the biochar to improve soil health and sequester carbon. So uh, over to you, Paul and Bill, I'm really keen to see how you guys have been working together to, uh, to, to, to save that energy. Okay, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, so we'd like to thank, certainly from GTET's perspective, uh, both uh, A2EP for the opportunity to present and also for uh, uh, for Bill for allowing us to uh, use the Jeffries business case uh, uh, to, to talk through as well, which Bill will talk through at the end. Um, so those slides are coming up okay, Jared, just to confirm. Yeah, sure do. Go for it. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Um, 
So GTEC's uh, engineering focused business, uh, delivering innovative turnkey solutions in thermal energy efficiency equipment. Uh, as Jared said, we were established in 2010, leveraging expertise and capabilities uh, from the founders long history in the global automotive market. Uh, the industry was established, sorry, the business was established to commercialize and refine its core technology. You know, I see generators while also delivering solutions around a range of other industrial thermal energy technologies, delivering innovative high value solutions. Our business is heavily invested into R&D uh, and in sourcing core system and component technologies, not least of which is our own high speed micro turbines, which is one of the only companies in Australia uh, and a, a select few globally with the capability. We have demonstrable capability managing com complex bespoke projects, including greenfield sites and remote locations. Uh, we've in, implemented projects for an impressive range of multinational and local clients uh, and support industry bodies in clean energy and waste recovery. Through our talk joint venture, we're technology members of the prestigious Global Long Duration Energy Storage Council that was uh, announced at COP26. We've been involved in a range of waste to energy projects and technologies, some which I'll discuss today. Likely the most common and robust technology for converting solid waste into thermal uh, and or electrical energy is the solid fuel boiler or oil heater. Uh, fuel handling and emissions treatment are the most critical factors and must be tailored to the requirements. The process produces heat, which can then be used in a heat engine to produce electrical power. Pyrolysis is the process of combusting organic material under closely controlled combustion, resulting in lower emissions. The process, process can produce syngas that can be used in a standard gas turbine or internal combustion engine generator or thermal energy that can be utilised by a heat engine generator. Quenching the fuel during combustion produces char uh, used for soil in agriculture, which Jeff, uh, Bill will talk about with Jeffrey's project a bit later. Anaerobic digestion of liquid organics produces methane, which similar to landfill gas can be combusted or used in uh, power generation after scrubbing. More than 50% of the world's energy is used in thermal applications and that close to 50% is used in industrial thermal systems. Uh, low grade heat, which we categorize as less than 200 degrees Celsius, wasted from industrial processes is often proven challenging to economically utilize, but can provide a significant opportunity in thermal waste to energy projects. Often waste heat streams can be utilized by simple heat transfer someone just went through before, so, uh, such as changes in medium, for example, exhaust to water, or even cleaning up the waste stream, for example, exhaust to clean air. Heat pumps allow low temperature waste streams to be econo economically lifted to higher, more useful temperatures. Thermal storage technologies allow for variable or intermittent waste or consumed streams to be stored and load shifted to match demand, thereby improving utilization. The heat can be stored as simple heat, so the temperature reduces as heat is consumed, or latent heat in phase change material, so the temperature remains constant as the energy is consumed. Stored thermal energy can be sourced from and generated into electrical power, thereby providing a long duration, low cost thermal battery solution. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in a, in a little while. I'll now discuss some of the thermal solutions that, uh, energy solutions that GTETS uh, can deliver. Uh, to process the waste of thermal streams. So the core the technology for us, as I mentioned, organic rank and cycle heat engines. Uh, it's the most common and robust technology to convert low grade heat into shaft power. RRC is a closed loop cycle, transfers heat from the source into a low boiling point, uh, organic fluid via an evaporator or heat exchanger. In turn, heating and pressurizing the fluid to drive a turbine. The fluid is then condensed by transferring the residual heat through the cooling system before being accumulated and pumped back to the evaporator. As with refrigeration, condensing can be achieved by cooling towers, air coolers, adiabatic coolers, or as a secondary heat transfer process such as drying. The organic fluid is selected for the particular operating range of the application. And efficiency is a combination of Carnot cycle efficiency, turbine efficiency, electrical system efficiency and the auxiliary loads to run the system. So overall uh, thermal to electrical efficiencies range from about 5% in very low temperature resource applications to over 15% on an ideal resource. 
GTET's developed uh, some innovative high performance RRC generated technology. Uh, we're one of a, a select few high speed turbo machinery producers in the world using aerospace derived gas oil free bearing technology. Our integrated hermetically sealed permanent magnet turbo alternators operate at 45,000 RPM with electrical efficiency over 95% and turbine efficiency over 85%. The high rotational speed results in significant power for a relatively small package, such that our turbine's only 300 millimetres diameter and 600 millimetres long. And multiple turbo alternators are manifolded in parallel to produce up to a megawatt generator capacity. Each turbo alternator is connected to a high speed regenerative drive, uh, outputting DC to a common bus uh, that's then connected to a single AS4777 grid certified inverter. Regenerative drive operates the permanent magnet alternator as a motor during starting and then adjusts the electrical load transfer to match gas pressure in order to maintain a constant operating speed uh, once, it, once it's running. The integrated drive includes the system auxiliary drives, including the working fluid pump, the cooling tower pump, uh, cooling tower fan, uh, which enables the RRC generator control system to select the most energy efficient operating point. GTET's RRC installations also manage power factor output of the generator to improve the site's overall power factor. A sig significant advantage in this asynchronous solution uh, is the turndown it can provide that's often required with a highly transient waste to energy application. So in order to investigate a heat recovery opportunity using RRC, we must first define the boundary conditions into the RRC system. So primary inputs include the thermal source, uh, where we need to identify the temperature, the fluid, uh, and the dynamics of that source. A secondary loop may be used to parallel multiple heat sources uh, or heat sources that exceed the working fluid conditions. The dynamics are often challenging where interfaces have rapid transients or the RRC is used to load level the resource. The cooling system typically utilizes ambient conditions and therefore average annual and diurnal uh, conditions will impact the output. Various aspects must be considered on the power connection, such as uh, voltage, whether you're setting it up for grid or island mode, whether you're gonna export or, or not export power, uh, with many of these aspects that are dictated by the respective power authority. The output boundaries to be considered include one, uh, for power, the power quality, which in Australia is typically AS4777 for embedded power generation, uh, power factor correction and FCAS compensation, uh, and what controls that the power authority may want over the generation generating system. Uh, two transient responses, such as thermal load following, uh, ramp up, ramp down times, uh, interface process variations on, into the generator. And three, plant integration, including interaction with other processes, alarms, trips, HMI, uh, and remote access. So with the boundary conditions defined, the system can be modeled. Our computer models have been refined to optimize the working fluid selection, uh, optimal turbine configuration, optimized heat, heat exchange of performance, uh, series parallel RRC combinations. With the objective being to optimize the generators uh, capex dollars uh, per kilowatt output. I guess that's our major metric is the, the dollars per kilowatt. Uh, system interface will be detailed with flow, uh, process flow, popping instrumentation diagrams, functional descriptions, uh, single line diagrams. As I mentioned before, thermal storage is a key to enabling intermittent and variable waste thermal energy to be available when needed uh, by load shifting to match demand. Phase change materials selected to match the application enable the heat to be released at a constant temperature. GTEC can provide uh, PCM storage from minus 20 degrees Celsius up to 90 degrees with 130 degrees Celsius currently in development. The high energy density associated with these phase change material typically delivers a megawatt hour uh, of thermal storage capacity in a seven cubic meter vessel. Low cost or lower cost sensible heat storage solutions, including insulated water tanks uh, or cementuous materials can also be used to 
where the process doesn't require a constant temperature. Uh, as uh, Jared says, and we've seen a number of times through A2EP, heat pumps provide a very effective means of producing thermal energy and supporting electrification. Operating on the Kano cycle, heat pumps can move thermal energy with a COP of at least two on a lift over 90 degrees up to a COP of at least five on a lift below 20 degrees. This means that heat pumps are excellent for leveraging low temperature waste thermal heat into more useful high temperature streams. GTEC currently has heat pumps delivering up to 120 degree hot water uh, with versions exceeding 150 degree hot water currently in development. The ability for heat pumps to efficiently modulate and turn down to match consumer heat loads results in a much greater energy efficiency and lower emissions compared to more traditional technologies, including gas boilers, dryers, or burners. The electrification of thermal energy using heat pumps means that when combined with thermal storage and variable renewable generation, such as rooftop PV, the zero emission, zero fuel cost thermal energy solution can be delivered. Heat pumps can also be used to leverage renewable sources such as low temperature geothermal or low temperature thermal solar into more useful applications. Uh, GTEC is currently developing through its talk clean energy joint venture some innovative novel technology in a low temperature thermal battery. The thermal battery is intended for long duration behind the meter load shifting of variable renewable energy uh, generation such as PV solar using rooftop applications uh, in the commercial industrial sector and mining. The COP advantage in heat pump charging coupled with ORC discharging with the energy stored in phase change materials results in leading range of efficiencies compared to many other long duration storage peers or technologies, uh, which can be leveraged when the site has a waste thermal stream. So for example, uh, data center cooling systems, uh, cold store condensers, uh, or even waste heat from compressors. Uh, the thermal battery also delivers very competitive levelised cost of storage, uh, leveraged by its use of commodity materials and long design life components. Uh, so I'll now switch over to Bill to go through the, uh, the project uh, case study that we did for Jeffrey's uh, biochar project in Adelaide. Thanks, Paul. Um, so just to give you a bit of background on Jeffrey's group, um, we're established in the 1930s, the trucking company. Um, we switched into soil manufacture after that. And during the 80s, we saw that we needed to improve our soils. So we got into the green waste recovery um, sector. Um, now we're, we've got one of the largest um, processing plants in uh, South Australia, and we recover uh, green waste from curbside councils and business to business. Um, we're seen as leaders in our field for the removal of chemical contamination, uh, utilizing X-ray and NIR sorting technologies for this purpose. Um, we're ISO 9001 accredited and have a range of Australian standard um, mulches and soil conditioners. Uh, we recycle over 150,000 uh, tons of green organics annually and employ a staff of over 70. Um, this project was developed to find a sustainable end use for our oversized fraction from our screening plant. Uh, in the year prior to the project, um, we completed independent studies um, to investigate uh, viable options for this output. Multiple biochar um, technologies were investigated as biochar has uh, many beneficial properties for soils um, and pyrocal's uh, CCCT technology um, was chosen as the best fit as it can deal with um, varying levels um, of uh, feedstock and types. And just next slide, Paul. Uh, just to give you more information about the biochar facility itself, um, the plant is designed to consume 30 tonnes of biomass today and produce about 10 tonnes of biochar at 50% uh, moisture content. Uh, it's designed for unmanned operation and once a day monitoring uh, to meet the unattended boiler in accordance with AS2593. Uh, uh, Pyrocal suggested GTET as the project partner uh, to make use of the waste heat uh, from the process. Um, so we installed a heat recovery steam boiler uh, that supplies four and a half tons per hour at 190 
three degrees C um, to the ORC. Um, a bit more on the financials, the project was part funded through uh, state government under the Energy Productivity Implementation Grant uh, with a total cost of around 3.3 million and the uh, electricity generation side of it uh, about 1 million. Uh, the revenue profile um, of this uh, has many varied uh, components with uh, biochar sales, um, electricity reduction from uh, the power from the RC. Uh, we also have carbon offsets which have come into play later in the project um, through a poor arts cork scheme um, as well. And um, a lot of uh, the final um, product has been used in our uh, fertilizer plant um, or, uh, for our horticulture and viticulture uh, clients. And a bit more on the power generation side of it. Um, so it's a 380 kilowatt electrical uh, ORC. Um, this was designed to the size to meet the uh, consumption of our uh, recycled organic sorting uh, plant um, with uh, excess being sent for export. Um, the site is um, in the SAPN's uh, SCADA size of uh, 200 to 5 megawatt. Um, so they can control the output of the uh, system to balance the grid for this size. Um, the, the ORC also provides power factor correction for our site, uh, which is a lot closer than our previous power factor correction. Um, and that's mostly about that project. Okay, thanks, Bill. I guess we're over to, uh, I guess, any questions, Jared? Uh, many thanks for that, Paul and Bill. Uh, we have had a, a, the odd question come through on the, in a bit of a in the chat there about the refrigerant used. And I think that's already been answer, answered there by Simon. So that's, uh, we're all covered there. I might just throw in one quick one for, I'm not sure if it's for both of you. I, I saw, I think it was maybe a $3.1 million project cost for a $300,000 return uh, or revenue there. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's quite long paybacks there. Is there anything, if you were going to do this project again, are we seeing technology move on that might see that uh, uh, even more attractive in terms of the, the returns since this project was done? Yeah, well, I think in, in some regards, uh, in general, costs are, are, are increasing. That's that's the uh, the downside at the moment, particularly electrical costs mm. and uh, and freight of you know what have getting uh, materials out. Um, so it, it is, as I said before, it is a, a matter of making sure that the system has been optimised uh, for the particular heat source. Um, and so quite often we find. In a lot of, I'm not saying Jeffrey's, but certainly other projects and clients we've been with, uh, we find it quite typical that clients will overestimate how much how much heat they've got and you know, potentially upsize the uh, the plant or, or not come up with the most effective uh, plant for this. So certainly getting getting GTED involved early on in that process and the feasibility and and being involved in the the total system design. Uh, you know, even if we're not taking it on as full systems contractor, but certainly being involved in the systems design is important to make sure that you've got a got an optimised solution. Brilliant. Uh, many thanks for that, Paul and Bill. And, and gee, you can really see the relevance of this coming with that uh, increasing demand for firmed renewable generation. So, uh, yeah, I'll be watching this technology uh, closely and 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 uh, look look forward to more success stories there. Uh, many thanks to you both. Uh, if we move on now to, and start looking at uh, uh, refrigeration and opportunities there that uh, Selwyn briefly touched on, let's uh, take a bit more of a deep dive of that. And uh, so for that, I'd like to welcome Stefan Jensen, from, the Managing Director from Scantec. Uh, Stefan has uh, uh, quite a long and extinguished career within, uh, within the refrigeration world, starting in uh, 1978 with Danfoss in Denmark. 
1996, moved out to, was, was in Australia to kick off uh, Scantech Refrigeration Technologies. Uh, anyone in the refrigeration space is, is aware of, of uh, Stefan. He's authored many different technical papers, sat on uh, various different committees and what have you, and, uh, and, and done many, many different presentations. So uh, it, it's an absolute pleasure to have Stefan here today and, and telling us what's happening with uh, uh, heat recovery and refrigeration. So uh, over to you, Stefan. Yep, that's come through. Perfect, thanks, Stefan. Thanks very much, Jared, and good afternoon, everyone, for taking the time uh, to attend this uh, this little webinar. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. I'll just show you a, a couple of heat recovery ex examples um, from our practical life, the things we do all day, every day. So here goes, if I can get this to work. Hmm. Ah, here we go. So two examples. Uh, one, one example is from uh, an existing installation that was commissioned about 10 years ago. The two package chillers, water chillers um, that uh, are air conditioning a, a public administration building south of Brisbane. Um, the, the chillers are using refrigerant ammonia and there's a little de-superheater fitted to uh, these chillers for the purpose of producing hot water, domestic water. And the other one is a very large plant. It's a 500,000 cubic meter cold store where we are. We fitted a de-superheater to uh, the discharge pipe, the common discharge pipe out of the ammonia uh, compressors to uh, recover some high grade heat there that's used for a number of purposes <coughs> in the plant. Now, First of all, might, might sort of dwell a little bit on what a de heater is. So this little diagram here, that round thing with a, with a top hat is a compressor. And uh, the other rectangular thing there is a de heater. I've shown this as a cylinder tube, it doesn't have to be that way. The numbers, one, two, three, uh, four, you see later, they, they are representative of, of the condition of the refrigerant. So inlet condition uh, to the compressor is number one, saturated uh, suction temperature, you can see here zero degrees, uh, the enthalpy is shown. Once um, the gas has been compressed, it reaches condition two. You can see the temperature has gone up to 91 degrees and the enthalpy has increased. Then condition three is downstream of the de-superheater. There we have taken the superheat of the ammonia gas out or any gas. So that is the process that happens in the de-superheater. We de-superheat the refrigerant gas coming out of the refrigeration compressor to a point that is close enough to the saturation point. In other words, just before the refrigerant starts to uh, condense. So in, in refrigeration, we use a tool that is called the lock pH diagram. Some of you will be familiar with that. Um, I've drawn the process there, one, two, and three. So one to two is the compression, two to three is the de-superheating process, and from three to four is the condensation, where we remove all the heat from the refrigerant gas and return it from vapor into liquid. Now it's important to note here that in an ammonia plant, uh, we can only recover uh, roughly 12% of the entire condenser heat rejection. This is assuming we have reciprocating compressors. If we have other types of compressors like screw compressors, that 12% is less. More about that later. But this is what I've tried to show with that little formula down the bottom. In this particular case, uh, we can recover high grade heat to the tune of 12% of the total condenser heat rejection that comes out of that compressor. Or it can be multiple compressors that operate in parallel. So here's a little uh, photo of, of the first example. These are two water chillers 
600 kilowatts cooling capacity each. Uh, they produce till water, standard air conditioning temperatures uh, from 12 down to six degrees. You can't quite see the DCV either here. It's just the little silver thing that sits on top of the compressor. I don't know whether you can see my cursor on the other end, but it's sort of in, it's a little thing about a meter long by about 100 millimeters diameter sitting right there above the, the compressor. And it uh, desuperheats the discharge gas uh, and produces about 70 kilowatts. And that 70 kilowatts can be used for uh, heating domestic hot water. Now, the, the, uh, there's a lot more to a desuperheating system than just the desuperheater and just the heat exchanger itself. The heat exchanger itself, you can see there in the top of the picture, that's the same rectangle we looked at before. But this time around, I've added a bypass because sometimes these things, they uh, fail. And then you've still got to be able to run the plant, the refrigeration plant, while you're repairing the desuperheater. So it's good practice put a bypass around it. The other rectangle to the right in the picture, that is the water-cooled condenser. And then you see down the bottom here, we have um, another heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger sits between the water we actually consume, the water that comes out of the taps, and the closed circuit, the closed water circuit that we circulate between that heat exchanger and the desuperheater. Uh, we are required to have a double heat exchange for domestic hot water services. But I mean, we also need to have that water to water heat exchanger that you can see there. That's the one, if you can see my cursor, this, this rectangle here. Because if we were to put uh, domestic hot water or potable water directly through the desuperheater, heater, we get formation of, of calcium oxide. And this ha happens very rapidly uh, within a few months. And if you cannot clean the desuperheater on the water side, you can cut it out and throw it away unless you have an indirect circuit like that. Now, in, in calculation terms, if we know the mass flow of refrigerant, this is what is called M in that equation, and we know the enthalpy differences. This is from the previous picture. We can estimate here that we can recover about 70 kilowatts maximum out of this desuperheater. So I reduced that by two kilowatts for a couple of reasons. First of all, the pump costs a bit of power and also the desuperheater has a pressure drop. And when we cause a pressure drop in the discharge line of the compressor, we increase the power on the refrigeration compressor marginally. So these couple of kilowatts, they account for those losses. I do concede that we have a gain on on the condenser. In other words, the condenser that sits downstream of the desuperheater doesn't quite have to work as hard, but I've sort of ignored that in this, in this comparison. Then we come to the, uh, this is a, a bespoke ammonia plant that runs a, a 500,000 cubic meter coal store in Queensland. So we have a mixture of compressors here, on the left, you can see some screw compressors. And on the right, you see some reciprocators. We are recovering heat from the reciprocating compressors. They sit on the second compression stage. Screw compressors, they sit on the first compression stage. And here you see uh, uh, the d heater is of the plate type. And uh, you can see both heat exchangers here, the blue one is the one that um, is an ammonia water heat exchanger. And the other one next to it, that little water to water heat exchanger is the one I showed in the previous diagram. This is uh, to create a closed water loop for the desuperheater itself. So we avoid that it fouls up. The pump in the foreground is that pump that circulates the water through the closed circuit. So again here, the, the, the plate heat exchanger you see in that picture was probably $20,000. But the capital cost of the entire system, if we include the seven and a half cubic meter insulated water storage tank that uh, serves as a buffer and all the other uh, auxiliaries around it, the, the price climbs to about 120000 150000 
depending on the extent of the pipe work and so on. So the heat exchange itself is kind of a small thing in the scheme of things. In this particular case, we use the hot water for three things. We uh, heat the subfloor below the freezer. This is a freezer floor that's about 240 by 120, 110 meters in that order, 26,000 square meters. So the design capacity is about 16 watts per square meter, but that's not what the floor uses. When the freezer runs at about minus 20, it uses between one and two watts uh, per square meter, but we design for uh, 16 for a number of reasons that I won't get into here. Secondly, we use the warm water that comes out from the desuper heater. It's in the order of the usual part, generally about 80 degrees. 90 degrees or 93 degrees, as you see there on the picture, is when we're running 35 degrees condensing temperature. We try not to do that, of course, because it uses too much energy. So we let the condensing temperature float. And then the available temperature from the desuperheater floats down with it. So in all the glycol air coolers for the medium temperature services, uh, we have a little heat exchanger so that we can run warm glycol defrost for all the medium temperature air coolers. So on one side of that little heat exchanger, we've got the glycol that circulates through the cooler. And on the other side, we have the hot water and then uh, some valves so that we can, during defrost, generate a closed circuit of warm glycol through the cooler so the ice falls off. And the third use is regeneration of desiccant dryers. Desiccant dryers are used in large freezer applications to prevent slippery floors. Slippery floors are dangerous when people fall over, they lodge a workers' compensation claim, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So the regeneration of a desiccant dryer happens by pumping warm air of 60 to 70 degrees through a corner of the desiccant wheel to dry the moisture out. So the, the warm air is heated with the hot water that comes from the desuperheater. And um, this is significant. Uh, in, a, in a 40 to 50,000 cubic meter cold store, an electrically regenerated desiccant dryer can consume up to 10% of the electricity consumption of the refrigeration plant that runs that cold store. So this is quite significant. I mean, a typical 40,000 cubic meter coal store with a low charge ammonia plant will take 1,200, around 1,200 megawatt hours a year. 10% of that is very significant. So the cattle cost of this system I showed you on the other picture is about 100,000. That does not include um, the storage tank, the insulated 316 stainless steel storage tank for the hot water will add another $70,000. So we are saving 245 megawatt hours a year. If that guy, if that client pays 10 bucks per, or 100, 100 bucks per, per megawatt hour, you can work out uh, it's about $25,000 a year. So a payback of about four years. On the picture on the right, you see the subfloor heating pipe being laid. It sits uh, below the structural slab about 30 kilometers of heating pipe in this particular exercise. And uh, just some concluding remarks about reciprocating compressors versus screw compressors. We see discharge gas temperatures in reciprocating compressors from about 80 to 130 degrees, sometimes up to 150 degrees at part load. With screw compressors, it's much less. Oil injected screw compressors, we see maybe 65 to 85 because a lot of the heat of compression is removed by the oil that's injected between the rotors. We can still recover that heat, but it is at a lower temperature. Typically, the oil temperature in a screw compressor is about maybe 50, 55 degrees entering the compressor and um, 70 degrees or so entering the oil cooler. Desiccant dryers uh, are gaining popularity for a whole bunch of reasons. The main reason being the prevention of slippery floors. Other reasons are extending the defrost intervals. 
so that we have more hours between uh, each defrost. Uh, improvement in product quality, we don't have any frost uh, settling down on the product and quite often the product is, is barcoded. Frost on the product uh, prevents you from reading the barcode. And large scale ASRS system, automatic storage and retrieval systems for boxes, the meat and cartons and the like, uh, they require dew points that are sometimes below minus 30 because otherwise their automatic retrieval system simply do not work. So this is an, an application that's coming more and more. Uh, we can also recover the, all the 88% the uh, condenser heat, of course, but that is at a much lower temperature and it may be a problem finding a use for those lower temperatures unless another high temperature heat pump is added to the system like Jared was alluding to before. The recoverable amount of heat, of course, varies with the plant load. Uh, we try to uh, make part load performance highly efficient because that saves energy on the refrigeration plant. And when the plant uh, reduces in load because it's night time or it's a holiday or whatever the case might be, then we need, we need to accommodate that. And this usually happens with storage. So we have hot water storage so we can overcome those periods of, of low load where we don't recover as much heat as we can, can at full load. And uh, finally, we can recover, we can use these superheaters in all kinds of plants. Uh, the peculiarity of ammonia is that it has a high discharge temperature. This is a direct result of the CPCV value. Some people call that the kappa value. It's a ratio between uh, liquid and, and, um, and vapor uh, specific heats. And typically an HFC refrigerant might have a kappa value of 1.2, therefore a lower discharge temperature ammonia is 1.4, and therefore ammonia has one of the highest discharge temperatures of all the refrigerants available for us to use. So thanks a lot for listening. Um, if you would many like thanks, to ask Matthew. any questions, uh, feel free. Absolutely, we've got a, we've got a, a couple of minutes for that before we get to Murray. Uh, so many thanks for that, uh, Stephen. If I can just throw a, a one in there first, I heard you said for reciprocating a, a compressor, you've got about 12% of the heat available uh, that's being rejected uh, that you can pick up in the D superheater. For a screw compressor, where you've got a lot more, a lot more heat goes to the oil. Uh, if you were to say add the the D super heating heat and the heat from the oil, is that twelve percent as well, or, or where any what's what's the sort of rule? Yeah, pretty, pretty well. Remember that if we recover the heat from from the oil cooler, the screw compressor oil cooler, we can probably get no more than sixty degrees out of that, uh, mm. maybe sixty five. And if we take that same heat and then push it through the D superheater, well, if you supply a 65 degree C heat into a D superheater in an attempt to uh, recover heat in the D superheater, you cannot cool the discharge gas down below the heat you, you, you put into it, right? So in, in practice, you end, sometimes end up with two loops. Hmm. And, then, and then you've got to find a use for the low temperature uh, loop and you've got to find a use for the higher temperature loop that comes out of the D superheater. Whereas with a with a D superheater for a reciprocating compressor plant, well, there's one D superheater sitting in the main discharge line that is fed by all the reciprocating compressors. So if you're designing a plant from new, well, that's the part you want to follow because you can get more heat and you can get heat at a higher temperature and it's simpler and easier to design and install. Yeah, gotcha. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, oh, we're just one more. We've got a quick question coming. Let me check that one. Uh, 35 degrees is the con saturated condensing temperature. Yeah, I think we've got that covered now uh, through there in the chat as well. Um, if, if I uh, uh, look at one final question there, um, if you were just preheating some boiler feed water, Stefan, I understand you probably wouldn't need that secondary loop. You know, if that was uh, already softened water without the calcium in there, are you happy for that to go straight through the do superheater and, and, and give you 80, 80 degree water or so? Yeah, sure. But I mean, I've been caught before mm. <laughs> where, 
you get told that there isn't anything in the water and there is and you end up with a deep superheater that is not cleanable and clogged up on the shell side and you can throw it away after six months off so, she goes you've got a calcium accumulator there are there are other types of deep superheaters that are cleanable uh tube and tube ones where you have access you, you've got the the water going through the center tube and the ammonia going through the annulus you can design those things so you can clean the water side with a with a bottle brush so but they're elaborate and not exactly cheap and it's not something you just go and buy down the road like you buy a plate heat exchanger or a shell and tube so. good one we'll put that back to alpha laval and ask for someone to to, to develop something for this uh, oh be, they got they got something very similar very similar to that i know i know they do uh, Stefan, many thanks for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. Much appreciated. Uh, let's go to our final presenter now, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Murray, ne Murray Nottle to share his screen while I give him a quick intro. Uh, uh, Murray Nottle is a mechanical engineer from the Kano Group and uh, a lifelong interest in affordable and practical energy efficiency. Uh, he's working with compressed air industry for more than 25 years and uh, been with the Carnot Group for over 10 years, working on compressed air and other projects. Um, he often uh, works for, in consulting for other consultants and help them for, for guidance in, in compressed air. He certainly, uh, uh, what he uh, what I know about compressed air, he's already forgotten. Uh, and and, uh, and certainly when, if you're thinking about uh, looking at a, a new air compressor because your supplier has told you that the only way to fix your air compressor problem is with bigger air compressors, I do recommend you speak to Murray first. Uh, but uh, today he's going to talk to us about heat recovery from air compressors. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, uh, Murray. Thanks, Jared, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land of where I am, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, yes, today I'll be talking about waste heat from an air compressor to heat water. Um, and I'll be discussing the front end engineering design to support uh, a CAPEX proposal. Um, for those of you who have got oil free machines, I'm sorry, my presentation is focused on oil flooded machines uh, because that's 90 to 95% of the market, but I can certainly help you with oil free machines as well. Uh, firstly, about the Carno Group, we're named after Sadie Carno, who is a Frenchman who's considered the father of thermodynamics. Uh, we're engineering consultants and we work with uh, brownfield sites predominantly. Uh, so we up, troubleshoot old systems, upgrade them, we'll install new plant and equipment and processes. Uh, we do data logging, we've got advanced computer modeling um, in finite element equipment. And our main customers are manufacturing, mining and water utilities. So why doing this presentation now? Um, OEM air compressors have had recover, heat recovery options for over 20 years, but very few have been sold. Now, part of that is because the compressor salesmen only think about selling air compressors, not equipment beyond that, but also because customers have got energy silos and it is too hard to think between the energy silos. Uh, some common experience is that you can only recover 60% of the heat from an air compressor for 60% of the time. Now, I don't know the systems where that's come from, uh, but I suggest it could be a poorly maintained or poorly implemented systems. And there's lots of pitfalls, which we'll hopefully try and steer around a few of that a while ago. I'm getting confused. Um, Jared had talked already about the graphics on the right. Uh, these are talking about where the energy prices are going. Uh, that was a month or so ago from Tenant Reed. Um, I heard overnight that some of those prices are actually substantially worse brought on by the current cold snap and as we've heard the, the overseas situation is uh, going to make things a whole lot worse as well. Um, so as I've said this presentation aims to help sites get approval for a capex um, for a well designed and evaluate heat recovery system. People don't understand what's required inside a compressor um, customers don't understand it, dare I say a lot of the compressor companies don't understand it, and other, a lot of the consultants don't understand it, so it's all become too hard, so people haven't gone there. So a capex, which you need uh, for any project to proceed, uh, needs to have a justification for it to, be, to occur, so for energy efficiency work, this would be usually energy savings, but you could have your other goals like net zero 
2030 corporate goals, and it needs a cost estimate. And the cost estimate needs that front end engineering work to be done. And the document becomes the technical reference for the project to go forward with. So the feed captures when and how much energy can be recovered and can be used. And we've heard people already talk about the need for thermal storage to mix and match between what's available at night and what can be generated during the day. Uh, the temperatures and fluid and energy flows to allow the selection of your heat exchangers. So Selwyn and his colleagues can, can help you out with that. Uh, the concept system design and an installation plan, how are you actually going to implement the heat recovery system? And that then leads you to having a cost of a bill of materials, so a price on how you're actually going to put everything together. So what's actually inside a, an air compressor and where are all the heat flows? Um, so this is a generic drawing of an air compressor. Uh, the air comes in to the top left there, goes into the air in, which is a compression module, gets compressed and all gets added to it. Uh, as we've heard with uh, the refrigeration screw compressors, I'll inject all there, same with an air compressor for most of them. The hot air oil mixture goes into what's called the separator tank and the oil drops out and the air gets out, goes out to the after cooler. Now the whole mixture is kept at around about 70 to 80 degrees, that oil going back in and it's result in high separator temperature and that is kept up, up to 80 to 95 degrees. And that is to stop water condensing in the system. So you can't um, overcool the system or else you'll get oil build up and you'll rust out inside your machine. If you go too hot, the oil will break down very quickly and you can actually get separated fires and fires inside a compressor. So it's a bit of a balancing act. The compressor controls will shut down a machine if it gets much above 95 degrees, it'll start to alarm and they'll shut down between 100 and 105 and that depends upon the compressor manufacturer. Um, as far as where all the heat comes and goes, so about 95, uh, probably 85 to 90% of the energy is provided to your main drive motor. Uh, of that, 5% is lost as due to motor efficiency losses. If you've got a VSD, that'll add another two to 5% in the electrical losses going to the drive motor. And you've got your cooling fan motor as well, that will use between two to 5% of the compressor's nameplate power. So you'll reject 70 to 80% of the heat to your oil cooler and 20 to 30% to your after cooler. Now you've heard people talk about, Selwyn was talking about 80 kilowatts, 80% 80 of the heat going to the oil cooler. It is variable. It depends upon how the compressor is operating. And as you can see in that graph, the temperature being lost uh, and the energy lost through your after cooler varies with the temperature of the day and the humidity of the air coming into the machine. So if you've got wet, humid air coming into the machine, you've got to condense a lot of water, you've got to reject a lot of heat in your after cooler. So the actual heat loads vary um, with the time of the day, with the season, and with how heavily loaded your air compressor is. Sorry, going the wrong way. So, what are the temperature effects from recovering heat from an air compressor? Well, you need to maintain the temperature going back into your air end at that 60 degrees, 65, 70 degree sort of mark. I'll just bring up a little spotlight. Can you all see that? So around about this point, you've, you've got to maintain that temperature. This is a heat you can recover from an oil-flooded compressor. It's a mixture of your oil cooler and your after cooler. Uh, hence the reason why you've got your knee there, you're losing that heat from your oil and then this is remainder of heat from your after cooler. You're losing some after cooler heat to get to that point as well. The important thing is to have the cold of the water coming in, the more heat you can recover. If your water coming in is too hot, you won't cool your air down enough. So you've got your dryer and downstream equipment might be undersized, so you need to be aware of that. And for the best energy recover, recovery, you need to go for a single pass of the water. Um, so you need to get as big a temperature rise in that water as, as you can. And what I mean by that is for, to have that 70 degrees there in the water, if you've got say a five degree approach temperature in your coolers, the water coming in needs to be at 65 degrees. Now, if that water is only heated five degrees, it's gonna go out at um, 65 and 
you won't be able to use that water again to heat to recover the rest of that heat. Whereas you've got a 25 to 30 degree rise in that water, you can heat the water all the way up to the maximum it can do from that 65 degrees coming in. So it's really important to do with a single pass on your water, not lots and lots and lots of little passes, but a single big temperature wise. Yes, you've got a lot of lower water flow, which can upset your coolers a bit, but it also reduces your pump power consumption and you can go for small piping as well. So what do we actually need to put into an air compressor? Um, there's lots of different bits and pieces you can do, just bear with me. There we go. Um, so how much energy it can be recovered? You've got to log what your compressed air system's doing. You know how much power is going into the compressor and that will give you an efficiency curve like you can see here. You've got to log your hot water system so you know what your water flows are, your temperatures are, what your energy is in terms of gas and power. And also the, this will pick you up the mismatch between when your heat's been generated and when you're using and if you're going to need hot water tanks. If your hot water system demands much bigger than compressed air heat output, um, you can go with a simpler design for a heat recovery system. So you need to be aware of all of that when you're trying to design your system. Um, what you must really take account of in your model is what happens if you change how you operate your air compressor, air compressor system. Uh, so this little graphic up here on the right, uh, I've trotted out a few times. This is a real system I logged many years ago. You've got two compressors, they run at different times of the week. And you can see for the same airflow, one compressor, the bigger one, was using twice the power of the smaller one. Um, so if you had done a survey and you're modeling your heat recovery based on the bigger compressor, then all of a sudden you actually uh, started being more efficient and ran the smaller compressor most of the time. The amount of energy you've got available for your heat recovery system has gone down quite a lot and your economics might go out the window. Similarly, if you decide to do leak repairs, you might move from operating here to operating here. Now, these are, these are fixed speed machines. If you've got a variable speed machine, it might actually be going somewhere down like this. So the model needs to be advanced enough to be able to provide the energy savings for the CapEx justification to take you forward. So some of the design considerations from that, um, hot water system temperature rise, what do you actually need the hot water for? Um, are you going to fit heat recovery to all of your compressors or to one of them or to one of them minus your standby machine? Because uh, often you'll have at least a standby machine in your compressed air plant. And as we've talked about, how are you going to operate your air compressor system? Um, if you're only doing a reduced number of coolers, you can, uh, you have to optimize what machines you run so you can recover as much heat as you can. It's no, no point operating one machine that hasn't got heat recovery on it um, because you've just wasted your investment. Uh, need for thermal storage. And then we get into the, the fun topics which some of the other presenters have talked about, which is the reliability and water quality factors and how, is, how you design the system around that. Um, what happens when you're running the air compressors, but you're not running your hot water? Air compressors will run all weekend and all week, more often than not, because they're supporting a lot of different services and they don't get turned off. But if you're only a five day a week production operation, what happens on the weekend when you've got no hot water demand available? What does the air compressor do? Similarly, what happens if your air compressors are down for, one of them's down for servicing, say you've only fitted heat recovery to one of the compressors, when it's get, getting serviced three or four times a year, as they will, what happens with your heat supply system then? So you do have to have a, an alternate source of hot water for that backup scenario. And when you get into the insides of the compressors, you need to be aware that you're not creating extra stresses inside the machine, which can cause them to physically fail. Um, so in some cases, you've got coolers, which are the air after cooler and the oil cooler are physically joined together as one solid block of aluminium. If you were to take heat out of the oil cooler and not out of the after cooler, you could cause temperature differences in your cooler, cause them to stress and crack and fatigue. So you need to be very careful about those sort of scenarios. 
similarly, when you start to add, start adding extra pipes and cores, what's the actual volume of oil that you are going to need to fill those coolers? Um, the oil needs to be changed every now and then, a um, couple of times a year at least. The separator tank is also your oil reservoir and that has a finite volume. So if all of a sudden when you start your machine, you put all of that oil into the hoses, you don't have any buffer volume and your machine will eventually overheat. So it's not just a, a fairly straightforward thing. You need to consider all of those considerations when you're designing the system. Uh, we've talked about the water quality and cooler fouling. Um, Stefan did as well. Um, are you designing for a hard water area or are you designing for a soft water area? Uh, you will get scale buildup. A lot of compressor companies, the OEM systems, won't sell a system if it's going to be heating the water above 80 degrees because you, they're scared of scale buildup inside the machine. So you need to design your system. If you're going to get scale, how are you going to get rid of that scale and keep your system working properly? Or are you going to just replace the coolers? Are you going to try and clean the coolers? Are you going to do both coolers, one cooler? So there's a lot to, to consider in that respect. Um, and what, how tolerant is the water that you're heating from having extra heat added to it? So I had a customer where the new compressors have been installed, 400 kilowatts of compressed water. They've got a big um, high pressure steam system, which was uh, generating power before actually going out to the plant to provide process heat. And the customer said, no, I don't want water added to my boiler feed water because it'll overheat my um, feed water treatment system. He had big deionization tanks. Um, and if we were to go in after the DI system, it would um, potentially recontaminate the water. So how, how tolerant is the water to actually having uh, it all installed? So can you physically fit the equipment to the air compressor, you need to get access inside and outside of the machine. Um, most compressors need access on at least three or four sides to get to the different filters and coolers and change your oil and check the operation of the machine. And there often isn't a lot of space between the machines to do that. Um, it's typically sometimes as little as a metre, sometimes less, it should be more. Um, so yeah, you need to consider all of that and physically fitting the the system in and what production windows will allow you to plan for the system to be installed. So if you have to do a staggered installation, it could be way more expensive and difficult than if you can do it, say at an annual shut and do the whole thing then. So this is a, a suggested system. Um, it's, there are lots of different ways to do things and it depends upon what you are are planning to do this system the intent of this system is to give you the hottest water possible uh, so small small water flows um, and it's a generic sign designed for clean and soft water uh, you'd use this if the hot water system load was say two to seven times that of the compressor waste heat and it also considers the heat exchanges a sign most on the hot water side so the main things you're adding is a vsd for the cooling fan if you don't turn the cooling fan off, it will overcool the oil and still reject heat. So, and it's also direct power saving as well. If you can turn the fan off with a VSD, um, that's great. The VSD is controlled by the temperature of the oil coming out of the air end. If it gets too hot, the fan starts cooling. Easy. Um, we've heard from Jensen about the needing to have split systems. We've got variable heat loads in the oil cooler and the after cooler. So run variable speed pumps that are controlled on the temperature coming out of those coolers. So you give the, the heat recovery system the first grab at the, at the water, you run nice slow water temperature, nice slow water flows through it. So you get maximum temperature rise, the pumps, you tell them what temperature you want to come out and they run at that speed to give you that water. Um, if you're getting too greedy and going too high, well, the fan will run, you'll get your hot water, but maybe not all of the heat. Uh, once you're inside, you need to allow for the coolers, obviously, and the hoses for connecting the, the coolers in and out of everything. Um, because, yep, you've got to pipe the oil from here to there and the air from here to there. And also water side check valves. 
if you have any, uh, oh, yep we've only got a minute or so left i know you've got a few more slides is there anything we can just jump through in the last minute or so to... yeah, yeah i'll jump through quickly so what what will be a benefit for a lot of people um this is budget pricing for different size machines for the different items that you need to retrofit the slide before it um provides you some information on the uh how to what's heat flow rates what water flow rates you need for different size coolers as i said these are all flooded machines this data is plotted off here so it gives you an idea of what the cost for these major hardware items are but you've got to add in your vsd cabling temperature sensors uh an allowance for people like me to help you design everything and put it in properly and commission it all um, that's for the soft water system. Hard water system becomes a lot more expensive. Depends upon how you do it. This is one approach I've taken and cost it out. Um, and you can see that goes up quite a lot. Uh, quick case study uh, it was a boiler. Nameplate was 92% efficient. As we heard earlier, they're usually a lot worse than that, only about 70% efficient. They had a very cheap power bill, very cheap gas bill. You can see that the effective thermal cost of power the cost of the energy uh, in heat terms was about 3.7 cents compared to 12.2 cents for get power but even then and going through the rest of it over here we're saving around about six and a half thousand in power for a major hardware of about twenty five and a half thousand dollars in major hardware costs so this is only based on five days operation of the compressors whereas this is a seven day operation of thing it, you'll get more heat back for the compressors we don't have hard data on this system as we're planning to be logging it later this year uh, but it's a quick case study on on how we can go through it and everyone yep sorry have a look at the slides afterwards when they come out next week yeah. so quick recap um capex needs justification uh by it from heat recovery work it's a dollar saved um the gas is what was from a customer's bill was about 20 so 28 percent the price of electricity that would be very fluid that was um off their february bill as we know the wholesale prices are going everywhere um your feed provides uh the basis for your project cost estimate and your energy recovery estimates um so it's got your energy recovery data and, and demand re modeling results your heat exchanger selection data your concept design and your cost of bill materials. Um, there we are, everyone. Thanks for listening. Sorry, I was a bit bit rattled going through that. Um, any questions? No, that was fabulous. Thanks, Murray. We're just about out of time, and I think, and, and uh, yeah, that we'll make sure everyone's got your uh, contact details. If there's some other questions there, but uh, yeah, excellent summary there. So, uh, not a matter of just slapping it a heat exchanger. Plenty of advice needed, and I think we can saw that saw that from Stefan's presentation as well, where you've got to understand those those energy flows. You have to understand the uh, specific requirements re relating to water, uh, and, and really understand the system as well to to tie that in. So, uh, Murray, many thanks for that. Um, if I just uh, will share my screen for a quick wrap up here of other events and what's going on. Um, let's crank that one over. Um, so yeah, uh, just to, to wrap things up, uh, we've got a few events coming up over the next month or so. And uh, there's a member uh, members drink session tomorrow in Sydney. So all those that are a 2 ep members, we would like to welcome you along. Any problems with that one, then just shoot me, shoot me an email and I'll make sure you get the invitation details there. Uh, we've also got some uh, work that we're doing with Race for 2030. Uh, we're reviewing some research roadmaps there, having a webinar to let you know about the main research activity identified over these uh, six-month studies, one on Industry 4.0 Solutions for Energy Productivity and one on anaerobic digestion there. Uh, so the first one uh, is, uh, is on the 14th of June and the other one the 8th of June. Uh, on top of that, we're also doing a series of webinars for uh, Victorian government. And so the first one is set for the Thursday, the 23rd of June at three o'clock in the afternoon, where we're gonna start reviewing uh, heat pumps and the VEU method and, and give you an introduction to design considerations. After that, in a couple of weeks after that, we'll have a presentation on, on application specific design requirements, uh, covering a few different applications there. So yeah, something else for your calendar there and you'll find all of this uh, in the A2EP uh, website under events and you'll be able to register for those. We welcome, welcome everyone along to those three webinars. Uh, finally, if you did uh, want some more A2EP, feel free to go onto LinkedIn and follow us. There's a 
there's a post every other day and, and, and interesting information about improving energy productivity and it's a great way to keep in touch with us. Uh, so that's uh, that's the end of the webinar. All that's left me uh, to say is, is to thank you to our speakers today. Uh, many thanks to Selwyn Oliveira from Alpha Laval, Paul Keane from GTET, uh, Bill Parkinson from Jeffrey's Group, Stefan Jensen from Scantec, and, and then we had Murray Nordle from the Carno Group. Uh, you'll get the uh, the uh, recordings and slides come out next week and if you need to be in touch with any of those people uh, certainly drop me a line and I'll be sure to connect you up. Otherwise many thanks for joining us this afternoon and I wish you a very pleasant evening. Bye-bye.